Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, brought to you by LaserFox World and Endeavor Business Media. Today's event, How Femtosecond Fiber Lasers Propel Spectroscopy from Visible Across Mid-IR to Terahertz, will be presented by Yaroslav Sperling, Business Development of, of femtosec Femtosecond for Fiber Lasers at Menlo S Systems. I think that, that's actually Femtosecond Fiber Lasers and Christian Mauser, Product Manager for Femtosecond Fiber Lasers at Menlo Systems. And in addition, uh, Enrico Dardanis, Product Manager Terahertz Solutions at Menlo will come in during the Q&A to help answer questions. My name is John Wallace and I'll be your moderator today. This presentation is both live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time via the Ask a Question box in the presentation window. We will answer as many of these questions as we are able during the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, just type your issue into that uh, same ask a question box and a member of our team will assist you. Uh, and a reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. And it, this archive will also be accessible from the Laser Focus World website. For your convenience, we do have a data sheet with relevant emails and such that you can download using the event resources tab just under the ask a question box. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Yaroslav Sperling. Hello, my name is Yaroslav. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining our webinar today. Let me start with a brief introduction of our company. Menlo Systems originates a spin-off from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics. We are the pioneers of optical frequency comp technology. Our co-founder, Professor Ted Hench, received the Nobel Prize for this invention in 2005. Today, we look back at more than 20 successful years in photonics industry and count over 150 employees worldwide. Our headquarters are located near Munich in southern Germany with subsidiaries in the US, in China and in Japan. Ever since, Menlo System has been leveraging innovation in high-precision photonics, so we have been continuously expanding our product portfolio. As of today, we cover optical frequency comps, ultra-stable lasers, terahertz solutions, space applications, complete laser systems for quantum applications, and femtosecond fiber lasers. Today, we want to have a closer look on how femtosecond fiber lasers have been enabling state-of-art spectroscopies across a spectral range that extends from visible over mid-IR up to terahertz domain. As the range is considerable, we have quite a few experts in the boat today. I am accompanied by Christian, our product manager for femtosecond fiber lasers, by Milan, terahertz specialist and senior sales manager, and Enrico, our product manager for terahertz solutions. Let me mention Christian and Enrico will be at the Q&A session and they really love to talk about their stuff. Usually the more technical, the better. So please feel encouraged to meet them there. So the spectrum from visible to terahertz in terms of wavelength translates into a wavelength range ranging from a fraction of a micron up to hundred or a few hundred of microns. So spanning over three orders, almost three orders of magnitude. Of course, it would be a hopeless task uh, trying to provide an encompassing overview on spectroscopies carried out uh, in this range. But let me highlight a few fields that have been uh, making impressive progress over the last decade or so, and that share femtosecond lasers as a common denominator, if you wish. So let's start with attosecond spectroscopy at the XUV or soft X-ray end of the spectrum. Here experiments are carried out with so-called few cycle pulses. For illustration, a so-called streaking trace of such a pulse is shown here. Ultrafast spectroscopy is usually carried out with femtosecond pulses in the visible or near IR range. For example, 2D electronic spectra can provide femtosecond time-resolved information on electronic couplings and correlations. Frequency compass spectroscopy, a quite recent field, essentially relies on imprinting, if you wish, an absorption line shape on the lines of an optical frequency comp. Mid-IR spectroscopy is a widely used tool in qualitative analysis, for example. In particular, it may identify a certain substance by its so-called fingerprint spectrum, approximately in the range 5 to 15 microns. And we have the dynamically evolving field of terahertz spectroscopy, so spectroscopy in the wavelength range of approximately 100 micron or hundreds of microns. 
Derrads is becoming increasingly recognized in material science and non-destructive testing, for example. So what do have all these examples in common? Well, in one or the other way, there are femtosecond lasers involved. For example, they may serve as seed source for amplifiers or as a working horse for terahertz generation. On the other hand, it is clear that the femtosecond pulse trains will need application-specific tailoring. So let's have a look at the box of tools that we have available here. So what is shown here is a very simple picture of a femtosecond pulse train. It is characterized by a certain repetition rate in time domain and a certain center frequency in frequency domain. Let's focus uh, on time demand first. So the pulse train will be generated by a so-called mode-locked oscillator. Uh, simply speaking, this is a laser device that makes sure that uh, its cavity moles reliably self-organize into a train of femtosecond pulses. Um, this is the right time to emphasize that Menlo system has developed a proprietary mode-locking technology. It goes by the name figure 9, which is derived from the characteristic shape of the cavity design. And without going into details, uh, but we look at a design that provides extreme robustness, is versatile, and uh, provides exceptional low noise performance. If you prefer a more detailed outline, uh, you might want to watch one of our previous webinars, which can be found on our website. Going back to the pulse train, um, not always, but often, uh, the oscillator pulses will need some sort of amplification, so an amplifier stage will be needed. Also, pulse trains typically will need some sort of dispersion management, so to ensure shortest possible pulses for a given spectral bandwidth. This might be desired directly at the laser output or down the beam line at the sample. In some applications, modulation is desirable, for example, for fast power modulation or for even picking of single pulses. Other applications will require precise control of the repetition rate. For example, you might want to lock the repetition rate to some external reference or lock the repetition rate of one laser to another laser in a kind of master-slave configuration. Last not least, also locking of the carrier envelope offset frequency might be required to generate a frequency comp. I am skipping the details here, but should you not be familiar but interested in understanding frequency comps, I really recommend you uh, yet another of our webinars, uh, which really gives an excellent introduction and also outlines uh, the best-in-class performance of our frequency comp technology. I should also mention that this is given by one of the best radio voices we have at Menlo Systems. Again, you can find it on our website. Now let's have a quick look at frequency domain, respectively what are the options to tailor the center frequency or the center wavelength to a specific application. So for extending the wavelength coverage to shorter wavelength, commonly second harmonic generation is applied. In turn, for shorter wavelengths, one might refer to some sort of frequency shifting that uh, fiber laser technology offers, like for example, the so-called soliton cell frequency shift. For further shifting to even lower frequency, one might mix the shifted pulse train with the original pulse train in a process referred to as difference frequency generation. Last not least, for accessing spectral ranges that are hard to cover by any other method, supercontinuum generation might be employed. I should mention that uh, Christian will be illustrating all of these processes in the next section. Now, having reviewed the box of tools, you might say, okay, this is all nice, but I, I did not explain why it is beneficial to employ fiber laser technology in realizing all of this. Well, uh, let me try a simple pitch here. So let me show you three output power measurements for one type of our femtosecond fiber oscillators. The first one here is for shock testing under accelerations of up to 16G. The second here is for temperature cycling over a range of more than 40 degrees Celsius. And the third one here is uh, for reliability testing during 10,000 on off turns. So we hope the data speaks for itself. Now let's look at how the oscillator device itself looks like. Well, it is a device uh, of a size that you can easily hold in your hands. It's all fiber coupled, uh, absolutely maintenance free, and it can be installed with a switch of a key and can be powered by a battery pack if needed. So this is why we consider our femtosecond fiber lasers as robust, reliable, and ready to use. Actually, what you see here in the picture is not only uh, one of our oscillators, uh, but also parts of Christian, which reminds me I promised uh, him to keep the introduction short and concise. 
So before handing over, let me close with a short remark on which type of fiber lasers we are focusing today. So what you see here are the typical fiber laser gain media based on rare earth ions. Today we will focus on the most common starting wavelengths, which are derived from erbium and ytterbium, delivering fundamental output around 1560 and 1040 nanometers respectively. So what follows now are a few highlights illustrating how we use our modular toolbox to tailor femtosecond pulse trains to scientific as well as industrial settings. So Christian, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Jaroslav. To start with an example, I would like to highlight here a high-power ytterbium doped femtosecond fiber laser. This fiber laser consists of a laser oscillator, which provides laser pulses at a wavelength of 1040 nanometer and a repetition rate of 100 MHz. These pulses are amplified up to more than 4 Watt and compressed afterwards in a small and compact laser head. The oscillator, amplifier and electronics are integrated in a 19-inch laser controller box, which does not require water cooling. Therefore, the laser head can be very compact to provide more space on the optical table. At the same time, there is also no heat dissipation into the optical setup, and the system is maintenance-free. So to make it short, more space and time for your experiment. The excellent beam quality and the short pulses below 80 femtoseconds provide an ideal starting point for further nonlinear processes. Also, a pre chip can be adjusted to have short pulses after some additional external optics. And an acousto-optic modulator can be added for fast light modulation. To provide femtosecond pulses also in the visible, we come now to a frequency doubled multicolor laser system. We add a small second harmonic generation module to the compact laser head, where the light is converted from 1040 nanometer to 520 nanometer in a nonlinear crystal. Both wavelengths can be used at the same time with high power levels and arbitrary splitting ratios between these ports. The output parameters like spectrum and autocorrelation are shown here. Due to the same master oscillator, the output pulses at both wavelengths are synchronized and can be used, for example, for pump probe experiments. To extend the wavelength range further, we can add a supercontinuum module. By sending a part of the 1040 nanometer light into a photonic crystal fiber, the wavelength range of 600 nanometer up to 1600 nanometer can be additionally covered by generating a supercontinuum spectrum. The high power level at 1040 can be even increased to more than 10 watt, together with pulse durations of 150 femtoseconds or below the laser system provides enough peak power to enable many further nonlinear conversion steps. Customers of us using these low noise femtosecond lasers also seed lasers for their own amplifier chains and further nonlinear conversion steps to realize very specialized light sources for ultra-fast spectroscopy. Another technique to provide a spectral coverage far from available gain media is the peak shift, the optical spectrum. The 1040 nanometer pulses experience also stimulated Raman scattering in an optical fiber. Without going now too much into details, we are using and optimizing this process to create and spectrally shift solitons in a so-called soliton cell frequency shift. We realize this spectral shift in a photonic crystal fiber for starting wavelengths at 1040 nanometer. By adjusting the input power into the optical fiber, the center wavelengths can be adapted. To optimize this process, we had to perform numerical simulations and also tested various photonic crystal fibers. An example is shown in these graphs on the right, where we could realize a tuning range from 1250 nanometer up to 1650 nanometer with nanotrue pulse energies within the same photonic crystal fiber. Due to the soliton generation, we have always very short pulses at the laser output without the need of an additional optical pulse compressor. To cover also a very broad spectral range, starting from an erbium-doped femtosecond fiber laser, 
The general layout is quite similar and we can use again several nonlinear conversion steps to generate multicolor outputs. We start with a laser oscillator at 15-16 nanometer based on our figure 9 mode locking technology. After a fiber amplifier and pulse compressor, the high power 70 femtosecond pulses can be frequency doubled or used for supercontinuum generation in a nonlinear fiber. With a spectrum from roughly 1 micron up to 2.2 micron. Also, the frequency doubled pulses at 780 nanometer can be used to generate a supercontinuum indivisible. The, the laser can cover 550 nanometer up to 2.2 micron. The laser system can be also extended further with further uh, amplifier arms and even locked in repetition rate to other laser sources or references. I want to show you now how such a multicolor laser system looks like. In this case, the laser oscillator is synchronized in repetition rate to an external reference. After the laser oscillator and fiber amplifier, the amplified pulses are compressed in a free space compressor and frequency doubled in the second box. The third box includes the super continuum generation to provide femtosecond pulses in a broad spectral range. Due to the same starting oscillator, the pulses of the multicolor outputs are synchronized to each other and the power can be adjusted with arbitrary splitting ratios. An example of a supercontinuum covering 550 to 1050 nanometer is shown here. Due to the fiber-based laser and amplifier, there's only a small and compact free space pouch, which enables high intrinsic stability of the output parameters. A clear benefit of erbium-based femtosecond fiber lasers is a completely fiber-based design without free space optics. Due to the possibility to have access to both dispersion regimes in single mode fibers, the pulses can be stretched and compressed in polarization maintaining fibers. This enables a very robust, compact and cost-efficient solution for spectroscopic application also in harsh environments. By adding a small frequency doubling module, the 15-16 nanometer light can be converted in 780 nanometer femtosecond pulses. The introduced peak shifting can be also realized in erbium-based femtosecond fiber laser. In this case, it is even more simple due to the possibility to use single mode fiber for the frequency shift. The spectral range is interesting due to some characteristic absorption lines of molecules. Customers are trying to detect, for example, the concentration of trace gases like methane around 16-17 nanometer in the field or even from airplanes so far from a well-protected lab environment and therefore a robot robust, compact and easy to use design is essential. The fiber delivery in polarization maintaining fibers enables direct beam delivery with simple switching between different output wavelengths and configurations. The very compact footprint allows easy integration into optical setups and devices without complicated beam delivery. Based on the shown fiber laser layouts and designs, the wavelengths range from 500 nanometer up to 2.2 micron can be covered. However, the wavelengths range from 2.5 micron to 50 micron is rich of interesting molecular absorption lines and laser sources for this region are required in the field of mid spectroscopy. But it is challenging to get access to this wavelength region and also flexible tune the wavelengths with fiber laser technology. To overcome this challenge, we are using a different frequency generation process to generate mid-air femtosecond pulses. In this process, high-frequency pump beam is mixed with a lower-frequency signal beam in a nonlinear crystal. Thereby, a new beam is generated, the so-called idler beam. The center frequency of this idler beam corresponds to the difference frequency of the pump and signal beam. By choosing the fitting pump and signal frequency, we can get access to the mentioned mid -hour wavelength region and create femtosecond pulses in the mid-infrared. By making the signal beam tunable, we can access a broad wavelength range in the mid -hour. So let's have a closer look into the layout. 
We are using the modular concept and the nonlinear conversion steps we are introduced before. In this case, we start with the compressed pulses of an interurbium doped femtosecond laser. For the DFG process, we split the signal after the compressor in two beams. The first beam is used for the peak shifting of the signal beam. We are using the introduced cell, uh, soliton cell frequency shift for the spectral shifting. The second beam pass is used as a pump beam at 1040 nanometer. A dichroic mirror and motorized delay stage adapt the spatial and temporal overlap of the pump and signal beam in the nonlinear crystal. With the realized wavelength range of the signal beam, a DFG signal of 2.7 micron up to 8 micron could be in principle achieved. If we now look at the DFG output, we could cover in this example the wavelength range of 3 to 5 micron with a high power level of around 100 milliwatt and more. The spectral bandwidth ranging from 200 to 400 nanometers, which allows a broad spectral coverage for the different center wavelengths and short femtosecond pulses for time resolved measurements. The DFG spectrum can be shifted and optimized by different parameters within the same system layout by adapting the pump power in the PCF, the temporal overlap of pump and signal pulses, and the phase matching conditions to the new desired wavelength. We are adjusting all these parameters fully automated via software control in this kind of systems. By this, we can achieve an easy to use tunable media source with high average power in a broad media wavelength range. The compact free space part enables, again, a high intrinsic stability, even without active stabilization of the DFG process. Also, DFG laser systems with up to 250 MHz repetition rate could be realized. The compact and robust design with software control of the wavelength tuning and stabilization allows an easy and reliable operation. Also, the mid hour wavelength coverage can be extended in the shown DFG layout to go further into the mid infrared wavelengths range. Thank you so much, Christian. We have now covered a wide part of the spectrum. Lately, Christian told about mid IR solutions. I'm now taking you to a space which is at much higher wavelengths. I'm talking about the terahertz domain. Terahertz is commonly known as a section which covers 30 micrometer up to 300 micrometer of wavelengths. Or in transition to frequency, it means one terahertz to 10 terahertz. It's a region which is commonly addressed either by electronic means or by photonic means. And today, of course, the more interest here is on the photonic address of terahertz. Terahertz is very important because it is a Swiss knife tool for spectroscopy. It allows to monitor intermolecular vibrations. And because it's an ultra-fast and time-resolved approach, you can actually monitor dynamic processes, not only in one dimension, but also in two dimension. I'm talking about imaging here. It also reveals interesting material properties, such as absorption and the refractive index. Interestingly, terahertz is a polarization-dependent uh, spectroscopy method. So this is another parameter that adds to this nice spectroscopy means. And finally, again, we are talking about an ultra-fast method. So it has femtosecond resolution. When we look at the spectrum again, there are some very commonly used wavelengths which allow to generate and detect terahertz waves. I'm talking about erbium doped systems on the one hand and their second harmonic counterpart and a terbium based systems on the other hand. So one track of the terahertz generation detection is shown here. We are always starting by having a figure nine oscillator amplify the output, making dispersion compensation and for this first track, we use a second harmonic generation device, which uses high power systems, which are focused on crystals, on thin films, or simply being used in optical pump terahertz probe experiment, where the material is being excited while you are doing the terahertz spectroscopy measurement. Or many of our customers also use those system for their home built spectroscopy systems. So what are typical characteristics that such systems have to fulfill? Well, first of all, they have to have really clean pulses and they have to be short, particularly when we are talking about crystals, but also they have to be high power. And in most cases, 
Those have to be tunable, so the customer wants to choose between fundamental and second harmonic wavelengths. Now, this is how some labs can look like when they use free space approaches like the crystals. I'd like to emphasize here that there's a beauty of a terahertz solution that makes use of fiber coupled characteristics. And this is to replace such free space optics. So those terahertz traces are usually using a delayed line in, inside the emission and detection part to make a time resolved measurement. And we can make use of the 15, 16 nanometer output. Why is this nice? Because you can easily couple light into matured fiber technology. And not only this, but there are also semiconductor and fiber coupled antennas out there that de deliver the highest terahertz outcome. In total, this gives the experiment a much uh, wider flexibility. It allows to repeatedly measure your signal. No part of discussion about alignment and misalignment over time, no degradation. And it makes the experiment much more compact. So here's how terahertz time domain in fiber uh, works. We have an ultra fast laser, we have a pump and a probe pulse, and in between we have a delay line. This is to arrange a certain time resolve characteristics of your measurement. You pump the semiconductor, create electron and, uh, electron and hole pairs by this, which are being accelerated by applying a bias voltage. Now the outgoing terahertz waves can be focused and collimated by terahertz optics, the signal will be acquired, the photocurrent will be amplified, AD converted and computed by our uh, PC. You will have a time resolved signal and a spectroscopic part of your sample. So this is making uh, the beauty of fiber coupled terahertz because it is 100% fiber coupled. The fibers can be as long as 30 meter. It is a cost effective compact and a turnkey solution, but it also means that there is no misalignment. The system does not need to be actively cooled. And it does not need warm up time, so it's immediate ready for operation. Finally, this is uh, leading to an unriveled terahertz performance. And more or less, and, and nevertheless, those, as we are applying fiber lasers here, those are mostly temperature and vibration insensitive, particularly being fiber coupled to fiber coupled sensors. So, what Menlo Systems comes up is on the one hand, tailored laser solutions potentially including terahertz antennas at fundamental wavelengths of 15, 16 nanometer. And on the other hand, of course, we are a provider since 15 years that delivers complete fiber coupled solutions to the terahertz market. I'm talking here about a very free real time spectrometer with highest bandwidth, meaning 100 gigahertz to more than six terahertz and seven terahertz above. The dynamic range, which is compatible to or comparable to the signal to noise ratio spans them more than 100 dB. All in all, this is a seamless integration, it allows a seamless integration to your experiment. So what are typical applications? You see on the left, there's an image running that shows a real time uh, measurement process of a sample that is spanned in transmission mode. And you can see the different dips uh, originating from the absorption of this specific material. So material sciences and all is a big and hot topic for terahertz market. Uh, a few applications here include the semiconductor metrology market, but also the characterization of very novel devices that are under an investigation. All those can lead to 6G communication and quantum devices currently being used. On the other hand, we do offer uh, systems to a community that's being using those for bias sensing. So a very hot topic here that, as you can imagine, is the rapid virus detection. For instance, take COVID-19 or Zika or different viruses. This is scaling up and accelerating the process of the measurement as we are not using biological means, but we are using electromagnetic waves. So here, this group has shown measurements of the COVID-19 uh, virus by using terahertz spectroscopy and metamaterial in less than two minutes. And this gives you a result if you are positive or negative on the COVID-19 uh, virus. So we have just discovered terahertz time domain spectroscopy. As a matter of fact, synchronization is an important topic here. But think of ultra-fast pump probe spectroscopy. Here, even more, synchronization and timing is of the essence. Think of this image that I'm showing you here. All those rowers must be in time in order to achieve the highest rowing speeds and be the first in the, uh, the target area. Well, in classical ultra-fast pump probe spectroscopy, it is of the essence to achieve high scan speed. If you compare two time-resolved 
measurements in the terahertz domain we use to delay line-based principle. Again, having one pump and one probe pulse. But for some ultra-fast pump probe spectroscopy applications, you require much higher scan speeds. And particularly, if you want to cover dynamic processes, not only very long ones, but also short ones, and you want to have this large flexibility, you must apply a different principle. Also, you can and might combine different wavelengths and mix them to have a pump wavelengths at uh, pumping at this wavelengths and a probe pulse at the other wavelengths. And finally, the timing is of the essence, as I said. So whatever you apply, it must be really precise. So what we try to do is here to replace the delay line. And one principle to overcome this is the optical sampling. What means optical sampling? Well, in comparison to the earlier principle I showed you before and we had in terahertz time range spectroscopy, you can synchronize two femtosecond fiber lasers. And you do this really pre precisely. So you control and lock their repetition rate and you combine it with a slight offset that is electronically controlled via this engine that you see here in blue marked, the ASOPS control engine. ASOPS stands for Asynchronous Optically Sampling, which refers to the difference in the repetition rate given a slight offset by this achieving much higher scan speed than with conventional optomechanical means. So we are really talking about an electronic control of the delay, which provides in turn an unlimited scan window, or in other words, a few tens of uh, um, nanoseconds instead of picoseconds. And on the other hand, also it provides kilohertz scan speeds instead of hertz scan speed. Furthermore, if you combine two laser systems and do this nicely and have a control over different uh, locking mechanisms, you can also combine a 1560 nanometer source with an 800 nanometer source. Use the one for pumping, use the other one for probing. So it gives a much larger flexibility, the optical sampling principle. Mendel systems covers multiple wavelengths as we have just learned, and there are different locking methodologies that, uh, for instance, can combine a Mendel laser with an other laser source. It can lock in a Mendel laser to an RF source to have a stabilized repetition rate of your laser and many more. So please check out and ask our expert for a tailored solution for your problem. So let's talk about a few applications where you might use a dual laser approach. One that comes into my mind is photosensor development. There's one customer at the University of Tübingen which exploits or explores the next generation and gigahertz operating um, photosensors. Here, he studied the long intrinsic response time, having a certain pump and a probe frequency, looking at different timings between the pump and the probe pulse, and you see a certain photovoltage uh, being employed once the right timing is placed on the material. So this customer could make use of the system immediately. The customer used a compact style ASOP system, which employs a dual laser system at 1560 nanometer. And another application that I'd like to highlight here is development of pressure sensors. And particularly here, the principle of investigation is completely different. I'm talking about the so-called photoacoustics term, which means that optical mat uh, that material is optically excited, creating certain um, vibration on the surfaces. Any vibrations on the surfaces and deformations uh, that took place because of the photoacoustic uh, effect, which means a conversion of optical light into heat and then into ultrasound waves, which impede uh, vibrations on the surfaces. This principle can be used to detect it also optically, the ultrasound waves that impose a certain surface deformation. And these customers at TU Delft in the Netherlands use the optical detection principle to monitor the surface of their pressure sensors. This is to uh, circumvent any leakage from the uh, newly developed pressure sensors. So by using this technology and making use of Mendel Systems multicolor ASOP system, the customers and the group at TU Delft combined the benefits of two worlds, using the photonics part and the acoustic section. This means the optical excitation can select nicely the absorption of the material while the acoustic waves penetrates quite deeply. And then again, using optical means to detect on the surface gives you a super high precision. I hope I gave you interesting insights in the field of terahertz time domain spectroscopy. 
but also ultra fast sampling using pump probe approaches with dual laser systems. And with this, I'd like to conclude on my part and I'm handing over to Jaroslav, who will do a summary for you of our presentation today. Thanks Milan and thanks Christian for the diverting and instructive presentations. Uh, to be honest, I have to say I learned myself quite a few things today. So to wrap up, uh, we hope to have presented convincing examples of how femtosecond fiber lasers propel spectroscopy. They do this by an almost seamless coverage of a wavelength range that extends from 500 nanometers up to 15 microns and offering what level output powers. By unfolding the beauty of fiber coupled terahertz and as working horses in turnkey terahertz engines. And last not least, by offering convenient access to optical sampling via synchronization solutions. So no matter what kind of particular spectroscopy you are working on, uh, there is a good chance we have your application covered with a femtosecond fiber laser portfolio that combines scientific precision with industrial robustness. Thank you for your attention. Uh, but first, I want to mention that today's third speaker, Milan Uri, who is Senior Sales Manager of Terahertz Solutions at Menlo Systems, was not in my introduction. So I'd like to remedy that by acknowledging him now and noting that we really appreciate his contributions to today's event. For the q and I'd, I'd like to note that Enrico Dardanis, Product Manager of Terahertz Solutions at Menlo, will join Christian in answering the questions. So once again, to ask a question, use the ask a question box in the presentation window. Okay, I have a note that the video is still playing. So I will start again later, I'm sorry. John, I guess let's go ahead and um, and start the uh, Q and A. As you said, go right ahead. All right, I will start. Well, we apologize for that uh, occurrence, and I wanted to mention. I don't know if people heard this before or not, but I did want to mention that our third speaker, Milan Uri, sales senior sales manager of Terra Solutions at Menlo Systems was not in, in, my, in my introduction. So I'd like to note that we want to acknowledge his presence and his contributions, and we appreciate uh, his talk as well as uh, the other two. So for the Q&A, uh, Enrico Dardanis, Product Manager of Terahertz Solutions at Menlo, will join Christian in answering the questions. Once again, to ask a question, use the Ask a Question box in the presentation window. So the first question, uh, can you explain terahertz spectroscopy with femtosecond time resolution? Uh, that's a question for either Enrico or Christian. And if you didn't hear it, I can repeat it. Enrico, uh, do you want to, to comment on this? Looks like we may have lost Enrico. Um, Is that a question, Christian? Is that a question that's especially for Enrico? And should I move on to the next question? 
Yeah, maybe uh, we can explain it more in detail. Okay. So I will ask the next question and you tell me if that's good for you. What is the longest pulse to pulse delay you can cover with your ASOPS engine? Or is that another one for Amico? That sounds um, like a different question. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the nice thing is for the, the ASOPS that you have to, um, two, that you're not relying on a the mechanical delay. So you have two lasers, and in principle, the, the, the repetition rate between the so the distance between the pulses is then also defining your, your measuring window. So for example, for 100 megahertz, you can measure 10 nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. How much output power of YLMO mid-IR do you expect at 10 uh, microns? Okay, for the 10 micron, um, you can still use this uh, shown BFG process difference in frequency generation process, um, you have just to use another crystal. And in this case, for 10 micron, we would also most probably start with an erbium femtosecond laser uh, due to the fact that there are some uh, crystals available which are particularly better for this solution. Um, unfortunately, the, the average power is going down um, due to the uh, conversion efficiency which is also going down, down for longer wavelengths. So in this case, I would guess uh, one milliwatt maybe or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm trying to sort the questions. Because we don't have Enrico, some questions may be appropriate to you and some questions may be appropriate to him. Uh, do you see any other questions on the list that you would like to, to uh, try answering? Um, if not, we can end the Q&A because it appears that Enrico is not <clears throat> is not with us. There was was just one question about the uh, the intensity plots for some of the um, the graphs. So we are in in the presentation. Some of them they are in in linear scale, and some of them they are in logarithmic scale, so in dB. So especially for the super continuum due to the fact that we have a very broad spectrum, also with some fluctuations inside due to the supercontinuum process, um, we are plotting it in dB. Okay. Oh, it looks like we have Enrico. Oh, good. Hi, everybody. Sorry, uh, I had a small problem with my connection. Good to have you back. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Can Please. you can you explain terahertz spectroscopy with femtosecond time resolution? Sure. Um, so what we mean there is that uh, since we are doing um, time domain spectroscopy and we have a very a small transient, which is only a couple of picoseconds that we want to sample with our uh, laser uh, pulses, we need to have uh, this uh, femtosecond pulse width so that we can effectively sample the terahertz transient with enough resolution. Of course, uh, what limits also our uh, resolution in the acquisition is also our delay stages or how uh, well we can uh, create electronically a time axis. But of course, the laser is an important part of that because I need that my excitation and the emitter antenna and my excitation and the detector antenna are so short with respect to the terrestrial strengths and that I can consider them also almost like with a spike so that I can really sample uh, my terrestrial parts. Mm -hmm. um, we have time for maybe one more question. I'm not sure if uh, you see any questions on this list that you um, would like to respond to. If not, if not, we can wrap up the Q&A. And I would like to note to the audience that all of these questions, we have many, many more questions <clears throat> than we can answer, but all the questions will be sent to our um, speakers and to Enrico also, and they will answer them later at their leisure. So if 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 you're comfortable with ending the Q&A now, that's good. Is that, is that okay, Enrico? 
For sure. Okay. So we'll wrap up. W one thing I wanted to do um, was ask if you had any closing remarks. Um, I would like to thank all our audience um, for their attention. And of course, we will answer all uh, additional questions. And if you have uh, some further questions afterwards, or we would need some information, just contact us. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, I'd like to, before we sign off, I'd also like to note that we have a short two question survey that we'd love to have you fill out before you go. Um, and I do apologize for our couple of glitches, but it was a great presentation, it really was. Glad to uh, have everyone here. So I'd like to thank today's participants, Yaroslav Sperling, Christian Mauser, and Enrico Dardanis of Menlo Systems, as well as uh, Milan Uri, C Senior Sales Manager of Terahertz Solutions. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for today's presentation, how femtosecond fiber lasers propel spectroscopy from visible across mid-IR to terahertz. I'd also like to remind you that the webcast on-demand version will be available on the Laser Focus World website, and the link to the archived webcast will be sent to you via email within the next 24 hours. On behalf of Laser Focus World and Endeavor Business Media, we thank you for joining us today and look forward to serving you with future webcasts.